Hello, and welcome to the next installment of Law & Order, the video series where I look at and unpack stories from games. In this one, we'll be looking at the story for Techland's follow-up to Dying Light, the long-awaited Dying Light 2. Dying Light 2 takes place around 20 years after the events of the Haran outbreak. If you want to see the full story of what happened in Haran instead, look up there. But if you do know the story from Dying Light 1, you'll know that the GRE had plans to weaponize the virus and sell it as a bioweapon. Well, it turns out it's kicked off. Big time. There will be spoilers in this video, so you have been warned. Let's begin by discussing the plot. A lone wanderer, known as a pilgrim, named Aidan Caldwell, is running from some infected, jumps to safety, barely making it across. A man stands on a cliff edge. This is a man named Spike. Spike is a Haran 2015 survivor and a pilgrim himself. He wants to show Aidan something, so after Spike shows Aidan some survival tips, they go to a hideout inside which everyone is dead. It seems that the people here were having an end of the world party where everyone decided they wanted to go on their own terms. Spike wants to show Aiden the view and share a beer. Spike says that he's managed to track down a guy that Aiden is looking for, a guy named Waltz. Spike mentions that he's found an informant who knows Waltz, and that the guy lives in Villador, a nearby city. He tells Aiden that he needs to go to a nearby radio antenna in order to reach this man, and Spike and Aiden go their separate ways. After spending the night and contacting the man, now revealed to be named Dylan, at dawn, he asks Aiden what he wants with Waltz. Aiden mentions that he's just looking for his sister Mia after they got separated 15 years earlier. Aiden and Mia were experimented on by Waltz in a GRE hospital. This left Aiden with sort of supernatural abilities and made him more durable and powerful than other people. They agree to meet in the metro tunnels below Villador, so Aiden makes his way there. It turns out that Dylan needs something in return from Aiden. Dylan, for some reason, needs to leave the city, but he states that he won't make it on his own outside the city, so he needs Aiden to take him to a place, or rather a settlement, called New Paris. Aiden arrives in the metro tunnels, but is ambushed by a volatile, a special mutation of the infected, and is bitten. He is rescued by Dylan, who uses a UV light to get rid of the volatile. He tells Aiden that he's turning, but he needs to fight it. Aiden then blacks out. He wakes up a bit later, and Dylan is gone but there is a sound of a man being tortured echoing through the tunnels. Aiden finds a thug named Tahir beating Dylan and asking where the key is. Dylan claims it's gone. Aiden fights the thugs, overcoming them, and he finds out that they are working for Waltz. Dylan reveals that he was working for the GRE as a researcher and the key belongs to Waltz and contains important information on it. He tells Aiden that he needs to make sure Waltz doesn't get the GRE key and that he needs to get to a place called the Fisheye and give it to a woman named Luan. Dylan tells Aiden to get into a vent and run, but shuts it behind Aiden. But Dylan is killed by Waltz. Waltz spots Aiden in the vent and sends men after him. Aiden swims to safety in the form of Villador, but is in bad shape. He stumbles into a bazaar and is hung by the locals as they realize that he is bitten and is turning. However, he is saved by a local man named Hakon, who escorts him to safety and injects him with something called an inhibitor. Hakon tells Aiden that there are tensions in the city due to the leader of one of the city's factions, the Peacekeepers, being murdered. The tension is due to the Peacekeepers believing that the people of the bazaar are responsible for the murder. Aiden tells Hakon that he needs to get to the Fisheye. Hakon reveals to Aiden that the Fisheye is in the central loop. You need to go through it to the metro tunnels as the ground leading to the central loop is impassable due to chemicals dropped on it years earlier. Only problem is that since Commander Lucas of the Peacekeepers was murdered, the Peacekeepers are guarding the metro tunnels until the culprit is brought to justice. After obtaining something called a biomarker, a device which allows him to track his infection level, Aiden tries to make his way through the tunnels. It doesn't go well, as Aiden gets captured by two Peacekeepers on patrol, who deliver him to the new commander, Ator. Ator, after initially thinking that maybe Aiden is the killer, decides that he is not. Aiden agrees to help Ator in exchange for help getting to the central loop. Ator says that he doesn't have the ability to do that, but that if Aiden can help him, he can try. Aiden manages to track down Lucas's brass knuckles, a vicious weapon with spikes called the Lazarus, and that they have blood on them, indicating that the murderer was injured by Lucas. Ator tells Aiden that if he can help him identify the killer, then he can help him get out of the district, as they will no longer need to guard the tunnels. Ator tells Aiden that Lucas was murdered in the bazaar, so assumes that it must be someone from there. Hakon says that Aiden should speak to a woman called Sophie for more information. 
Aiden speaks to Sophie. Protected by her huge bodyguard named Herman, she tells him that she doesn't trust him, so he needs to do things for her in order to earn it because, well, of course. Turns out that Sophie's brother Barney had gone into a dark zone looking for some crystals. Sophie finds out and asks Aiden to find her brother and bring him back. After rescuing Barney, Sophie trusts Aiden now. She tells Aiden that a couple of bandits, Jack and Joe, have mined and taken over the water tower, depriving the residents of the bazaar of essential drinking water. The bazaar leader, Carl, wants to pay them with crystals, but Sophie thinks that Jack and Joe won't stay good on their word. Carl goes to meet with Jack and Joe, but of course it goes horribly wrong, and the entire group are wiped out by Jack and Joe's bandits, and they've kidnapped Carl and stolen the crystals. Sophie and the group meet and decide to retaliate. Aiden meets with Aitor again, who tells Aiden to be careful, and that the PKs are going to raid Sophie's camp. Aiden attacks the bandits' camp and frees Carl. However, Jack and Joe have fled, and Sophie's camp has been raided by the peacekeepers. Aiden gets there to help, and here comes the first key decision. Now, this is where your path may be different to others, as you can choose to side with one group or the other, but the end goal remains the same. Aiden gets a call from Hakon. Hakon tells Aiden that they should go to Aitor and tell him what they have regarding the murder of Commander Lucas. If Aiden chooses to help the survivors, he finds all the people in Sophie's hideout dead, activates the water tower after killing Jack and Joe, finds a piece of skin inside Barney's room with Commander Lucas's tattoo on it, but chooses to trust the survivors, who eventually help him to get through the metro tunnels by attacking the Peacekeeper windmill providing their main source of electricity, which shuts off their UV lamps. Or... Aiden can go to Aitor instead. Aitor tells Aiden that if he can activate the water tower for them, then he will let them through the tunnels. He does so, Aiden goes to Sophie's hideout and finds the piece of skin in Barney's room. Aitor turns up to arrest Barney. Aiden and Hakon leave through the metro tunnels, but there is a cave-in, and they have to abort their journey and go back to Old Villador. Aiden is attacked by Barney, and Aiden has to kill him. Eventually, after whichever path Aiden takes, he receives a call from Hakon stating that everyone is too busy to notice them, so they attempt to leave. All of a sudden, Hakon is hit by an arrow from a sniper. After Hakon is on the ground, a wound becomes visible. He is the one who killed Commander Lucas. Aiden tracks a sniper down, but she escapes. Aiden goes to the central loop through a tunnel which leads underneath a hill, and Aiden meets with the peacekeepers. This is either a hostile meeting or a friendly one depending on the choice made earlier. It's here that Aiden meets Waltz. Waltz decimates the peacekeepers, knocks Aiden out, and takes the key. When he wakes up, he is confronted by a faction called Renegades. Something happens to Aiden though, and he seems to turn into an aggressive monster, slaughtering the Renegades. Aiden tracks Waltz down to an abandoned car factory, and sees him activate a console. Aiden is saved by the sniper from before, and they both run. This woman is revealed to be Luan, the woman whom Aiden was supposed to give the GRE key to. What's more is that Luan is a former test subject of Waltz too, and that she is after him as well. Aiden finally arrives at the Central Loop. During his first few days in the Central Loop, he meets with the commander of the Peacekeepers, Jack Matt, and Frank, the former leader of a now disbanded special group of survivors called Night Runners. More on them later in the video. At some point, it's revealed that a transmitter atop the VNZ tower has been switched off for 10 years after it was switched off by the military, and Jack Matt needs it. Aiden goes with the Peacekeepers on a mission into the tower, but one problem, it's swarming with infected. It's also a volatile nest. Aiden ends up being the only survivor after the Peacekeeper squad are completely obliterated. Another choice comes in here. Aiden has to climb the tall VNC tower to activate a radio transmitter on the top. Now this is needed by both groups in order to broadcast messages, but Aiden can only give control to one side. If given to Jack Matt, the Peacekeepers are able to recruit more people to their faction. If given to Frank, the survivors are able to hear Frank's radio broadcasts, offering a message of hope and warning of possible dangers to them. Whichever one you choose, they can both help Aiden with his next task. They give him the location of a GRE doctor named Veronica Ryan, who can help Aiden get access to the GRE database located in the old observatory, which in turn can give him vital information about Mia. Turns out that on the database there's not a lot to go on in terms of information about Mia, but it does tell him about a secret facility named X-13, and that is a huge clue pointing to where Waltz might be. Aiden discovers that at this point that Waltz, after opening the X-13 facility, has activated a failsafe. A series of strategic missile attacks aimed at Villador in the event of the virus getting out of control. Waltz, never far away, arrives and takes the key once again. Eventually, Aiden loses control and attacks Veronica, killing her. Luan arrives and saves Aiden, taking him to safety. Throughout the central loop narrative, you can choose to trust Jack, Matt and the Peacekeepers, or Frank and the survivors. 
Whatever way you choose, Aiden eventually goes to confront Colonel Williams, who is holed up at the city's dam. Now, who you choose to side with has a bearing on what comes next. If you are sided with the Peacekeepers and Jack Matt, he wants you to open up the sluice gates, draining the water around the dam and letting his soldiers move in. If you do this, Colonel Williams runs off and later commits suicide. If you choose to trust the Colonel, Matt vows to kill Aiden. He tells Aiden that he needs to go to X-13 to stop Waltz. Aiden enters the complex and is joined by Luan, and they are shocked to find that X-13 is an Ark of sorts, containing loads of supplies and designed to protect and shelter powerful and important people, and likely the rich too. Aiden soon discovers that this facility is the location where he was experimented on. He finds Waltz and confronts him, revealing the shocking truth, that Mia is not Aiden's sister. She is in fact just Waltz's daughter. She is sick with the virus and he's been trying to keep her alive and has been trying to cure her for the last 15 years. Waltz refuses to cancel the missile strikes as in order to do so, this would require him to shut down X-13 and this means that Mia would die. Aiden and Waltz fight. Aiden defeats him and takes the GRE key but Waltz destroys it before he dies. Luan offers to sacrifice herself and destroy the bombs using explosives whilst Aiden escapes with Mia. Whichever you choose, it has a key impact on the endings. At some point in the game, you have to choose to fight Hakon, or not fight him. If you spare him, he joins you at X-13 and saves Luan just before the missiles are destroyed. If you don't, well, Luan is toast. Aiden can also choose to save Luan, but as a result, the missiles launch and destroy most of the city. Whichever ending you get, Mia dies a few hours later after being taken out of X-13. Aiden ends up leaving the city due to his infection. He's potentially also joined by Luan if she didn't die whilst blowing up the missiles. As for the city, well, whoever you sided and gave the most power to, govern the city. In mine, I chose to give it to the Free Folk. So that is the plot in a basic form, so let's get into details, as a hell of a lot of stuff happened prior to the events of the game. So in Dying Light 1, it was revealed in the aftermath that the GRE had commissioned a big pharma company called Vitamin to weaponize the virus as early as 2015. Rice stole evidence of those plans and leaked them and the rest is history. After the Haran incident happened, it's revealed that a vaccine was created to combat the virus. Humanity had prevailed and was saved, but this wouldn't last long at all. After the GRE had been under investigation for a number of years, a newspaper report finally came out on March 7th, 2021 informing the world of the scandal. As a result, the GRE were ordered to shutter their labs and stop their research on the virus. However, with the GRE being the big bad wolf that it is, after being told to close their labs and stop experimenting on viruses, they decided to continue doing so in secret anyway. The GRE and Vitamin carried on researching near Geneva, Switzerland, and they created a mutation of THV, which inevitably escaped from the lab on the 25th of December, 2021. The world was again plunged into chaos. An event happened known as the Fall, which was, as the name suggests, the fall of civilization, plunging the world into a modern dark ages. Over the years, 98% of humanity was wiped out by the virus. Large cities fell, and although there were small enclaves of survivors scattered around the world, only one large city remained, Villador. Located in Europe, Villador is a city with a lengthy history dating back to 930 AD. Its population pre-outbreak was around 2 million people. At least half of those would use the city's metro system to commute to and from work from different parts of the city, mostly taking commuters into the central loop. It was home to the looming VNC tower and had a fairly decent economy with car plants, cafes, bars and restaurants. It was frequented by many tourists and featured attractions such as a blimp and city tours. This all changed when the fall came, plunging this once great city into great peril, along with its citizens. Villador was in danger of becoming overwhelmed. Eventually, the military and the GRE would arrive in Villador and build huge walls to stop the hordes of infected coming into the city. The military would arrive in Villador and try to maintain control of the city, and as a result of curfews and citizens' firearms being confiscated under the orders of the general, General Pratt, riots broke out. The first of many catastrophes occur on March 6th, 2024, when soldiers loyal to Colonel Chris Williams gunned down 64 civilians in a massacre which would go on to be memorialized as the March Massacre. With the news that Villador was the last large city remaining, the world leaders, well, those who were still alive, made their way to Villador, set up an organization calling themselves the Council of Mankind. Through their various meetings, 
the council would come to discover that other settlements were falling to the virus, and as a result, thousands of migrants would be headed straight for Villador. More migrants than they could possibly manage, but the walls helped keep them out. Now, since the GRE were probably the only organization in the world still capable of finding a vaccine or a cure, they moved into Villador and set up labs. They made important discoveries. According to head GRE doctor Katsumi Kobayashi, they discovered that UV light played an important part in keeping the infection at bay and actually worked in a similar way to the way antazin would work. Antazin, you know, the virus suppressant drug from Dying Light 1. In late 2024, a group of scientists within the GRE discovered a compound named the THV Gen Mod, something they considered an effective weapon against the virus. This compound was said to degrade the DNA of the infected cells and eventually kill them. This compound was still being researched as a potential vaccine when, at one of the Council of Mankind meetings, the military, still under the leadership of General Pratt, demanded that even though the compound had significant side effects, the research be handed over to the military so they could use it, one, as a weapon against the infected, and two, as a vaccine for the citizens of Villador. Dr. Katsumi states in the Council of Mankind meetings that research takes time and that history shows us that rushing science leads to catastrophe. Well, she wasn't wrong. She gets overruled and what happens next is the second major catastrophe. In what turns out to be the brainchild of General Pratt, a plan is hatched to commence with the bombings in the city. Now this is essentially where the story of General Pratt ends, but we will pick that up later on. On January 6th, 2025, Colonel Williams, under the orders of General Pratt, carries out the bombings via drones, trucks and planes. Not only that, but they would aerosolize the THV gem mod and spray it over the city as the vaccine. It doesn't go well at all. The chemicals mixed with water and penetrated the ground, killing all plants on street level, also killing civilians. The only ones who didn't get killed were the ones lucky enough to get to a source of UV light. As a result of these attacks, everyone in the city became infected with THV. The bombings themselves killed 2 million people, most of the city of Villador. As a result, Colonel Williams would go on to be dubbed the Butcher by the citizens of Villador. In a secret facility named X-13, missiles were stored there as a failsafe. This was a failsafe designed to destroy the city and any trace of the infection should things get out of hand. X-13 was initially built as an ark to shelter GRE scientists and what remained of the world's leaders. After the catastrophe of the Black Monday bombings, Colonel Williams shut down the missile launch program as it threatened to destroy the city, and as a result shut down X-13 along with it. So, as previously mentioned, the bombings in the city caused a chemical reaction, killing citizens, but it also gave birth to horrifying mutations. The virus, when taking over the host's body, would act similarly to the Haran-19 virus. Now, some of these were similar to the infected types seen in Haran, such as volatiles, demolishers, bolters, and bombers. But with the new variant came new mutations, banshees, revenants, howlers, drowners, goons, and chargers, to name a few. Now, the infection cycle is fairly simple. Given that everyone in Villador is infected, a key discovery made by the GRE was that UV light has a similar, if not the same effect as Anderson would have. Upon infection, if the infected individual is unable to get to a UV light, the game is essentially over and they will turn. The UV light essentially halts the virus and reverses the transformation. Once the individual steps out of UV light, then the clock is ticking and the virus is growing inside them once again. And when the clock runs out, they turn into a viral. This is an individual who has just turned. They are quick and have retained some of their human characteristics, sometimes begging for mercy when you attack them, only to return to their infected state. They eventually degrade and one of two mutations happen. Depending on how long they spend in the sun and UV light, they would degenerate and become frail weak biters. If on the other hand they manage to stay out of the sun, they will become regular biters. Some are slow, some are fast. Now whichever route they take towards their final step in their evolution depends on many factors, factors which I'm not really going to go into in this video. They do of course have the potential to become a volatile. I will say though that these volatiles, 21 years on from the events in Haran, do seem to be a lot more aggressive and dangerous. Anyway, let's get back to the fallout after the Black Monday bombings. One person in particular who disagreed with the strategy of bombing the city was Major Jack Matt. Matt considered the fact that they only really had one shot at saving the city. Nevertheless, the bombings went ahead. At first, the narrative in the game points us toward the fact that Colonel Williams was the one who was responsible. Not only that, the fictional comic The Banshee also tells us a vastly different narrative to the one you find in the game, but only if you look hard enough. 
We find some tapes in the game from a Captain Posner. If you want to know more about these tapes, watch my Black Monday video. Anyway, Posner investigates Jack Matt and discovers the basis for the hatred he has for the Colonel. He also explains to us what happened to General Pratt. Turns out that General Pratt died prior to the bombings being carried out, but his plan had enough weight in the eyes of Colonel Williams as a legitimate plan. Long story short, Colonel Williams carried out the bombings under the orders of General Pratt. Now, here's where it gets interesting. In one of the game's paths, Juan is about to be hung, and this is what he says. Yes, I spoke with the Colonel, but only to save the city. The person you call the Butcher, he's innocent. The true Butcher is right there, on this ship. What, what the hell? What is he talking about? Open your eyes! Matt is gambling with our lives as he did 11 years ago, when he killed half the city. Because of his hubris, the military failed to evacuate the city. When pressed on this, Matt just replies, The condemned will say anything to save themselves. But what does all this mean? Well, Posner's tapes tell us that Jack Matt told people that the Butcher never warned him the bombings were taking place, which didn't give them any chance for an evacuation. But according to the Captain Posner tapes, the actual reality is that Colonel Williams did in fact inform Jack Matt and even advised him to evacuate. But Matt, for some reason, chose to ignore it. This is what led to the deaths of two million citizens in Villador. Major Matt saw this as an opportunity to, let's say, seize power from Colonel Williams and control the city. He started telling people that the colonel was responsible for the many deaths in the city. And people believed him. Tensions in the military started to rise and Major Jack Mack kicked off a civil war, splitting the military down the middle. People loyal to Williams and people loyal to Matt. They eventually had a battle against one another. With bad feeling towards him in the city and due to his role in the March Massacre and the Black Monday bombings, a revolution inevitably followed and Colonel Williams was forced to flee, taking refuge in the dam on the outskirts of the city. This plan took its toll on Matt though, as likely due to his exposure to the chemicals, he is sick and dying. This split in the military though would lead to two main factions being birthed, the Peacekeepers and the Renegades. Due to Jack Matt's civil war kicking off, he would eventually set up base in an old cargo ship, affectionately named Missy, and would found the Peacekeepers. The Peacekeepers are fairly influential in the city, but due to their brutal enactment of justice, the Free Folk tended to dislike them. A lot. Made up from former soldiers who took Jack Matt's side during the Civil War, the Peacekeepers made up rules and laws which would yield strict punishments if broken. Although they see themselves as a military, their uniforms are blue, indicating they are more of a beefed up police force than an actual army, although they do seem to follow the order of rank adopted by the military. The Renegades on the other hand are a gang of ex-prisoners and the men from the military who were loyal to him. Due to their nature they are hard to reason with and tend to attack on sight without hesitation. We'll dive deeper into the Renegades in the next section, but anyway, as mentioned before, the Colonel ended up taking refuge in the dam and eventually met Waltz. So I already have a video about Dr. Waltz and his motives, but we'll briefly discuss him here. Waltz was a scientist and a doctor who worked for the GRE, but we don't know how long he was in his role for. At some point, Waltz started experimenting on children in a hospital which, at the end of the game, is revealed to be located inside X-13. He was hoping to create a bioweapon in which the host for the virus would merge with it, retaining their cognitive senses and essentially not dying. He says at the end of the game that he was in fact trying to find a cure, indicating that his research was a two-stage process. Experiment on the children, and then from that try and find a vaccine from there. It's revealed in the game that Waltz had a daughter, and the plot twist was that the sister that Aiden was looking for for the duration of the game wasn't even his sister at all, Mia was Waltz's daughter. One thing you'll notice in the flashback sequences is that Mia had her hair in comparison to all the other kids, which means that she wasn't being experimented on. You see, Mia was infected and was sick, and this was essentially one of Waltz's main drives to succeed in finding a cure. We learn that a fire broke out in the GRE's lab where he was conducting his experiments, and this led to the GRE finding out about his tests on kids, and they fired him. But it was too late as the damage had now been done, and the virus had basically ravaged the entire world, leading to the fall. It was at this point that Waltz met Colonel Williams, who allowed him to set up lab in his base to continue his research. Waltz, in return, due to the renegades being weak and exhausted, offered Williams an army of super soldiers, if you will, and proceeded to experiment on his men. This is why some renegades tend to have blackened veins and just attack on sight. Waltz, however, screwed Williams over by causing the super soldiers to become loyal to him instead, and then Waltz proceeded to launch strategic attacks on the city. 
Citizens will think Williams is the source of these attacks, then the peacekeepers will attack Williams at the dam. Williams would then be forced to open the dam and flood the city. Due to a limited pool of test subjects though, and with his research no further in finding a cure for Mia, Holtz became desperate and started to experiment on himself, giving himself, well, certain mutant qualities. It became clear to Waltz that he needed to access X-13, and he needed a rare key known as a GRE key in order to open it. At first, Waltz tasked one of the Peacekeeper commanders, Lucas, to find it, and when he does, it's not clear whether Lucas refused to hand it over or not, but Waltz then tasks Hakon to kill Lucas and retrieve the key from him. This takes another turn, when the key is taken by Dylan, who meets with Aiden in the tunnels at the start of the game and is eventually killed by Waltz. Now this leads us on to our protagonist. Aiden Caldwell was born around 2013, making him around 20 years old during the events of the game. It's not known who his mother was, but Aiden seems to have vague memories of his father, with the only real memory being that his father saved his life at one point. At some point, Aiden was taken in by the previously mentioned Dr. Vincent Waltz while he was working for the GRE. Aiden was subjected to injections containing inhibitors, a cocktail of antizin and a THV derivative. Most children reacted badly to this, exhibiting severe side effects, but Aiden was different. His body reacted well to the tests. During his time being experimented on, Aiden made a good friend, Mia, Waltz's daughter. They got separated when a fire broke out at the Jari hospital, and they got separated after all the children escaped. For some reason, Aiden suffered amnesia and can't remember large parts of his past. All he recalls in his mind is that Waltz tortured Mia and himself. Not true, because remember, Mia wasn't experimented on, and that Mia was his sister and that he had to find her. Aiden would go on to become what was known in this new world as a pilgrim. Pilgrims were basically an outcast group of survivors who would travel across the areas between settlements known as the Outlands. The Outlands were very dangerous with very little protection against the infected. Due to the risks they took and the fact that on their travels they would have had to kill people, others would tend to act quite cold towards pilgrims, as if fearful of them. At one point during a conversation with the peacekeeper commando Ator, Aiden says that he travelled about 2,000 kilometres to get to the city from the Crossdale River. Throughout his growing up, Aiden had exhibited signs of being stronger and faster than others, and this resulted in him being a prolific runner, traversing the rooftops of the city with ease. However, Aiden's body was a ticking time bomb, and having become dependent on inhibitors to get even stronger, Aiden started to show signs of turning. Oh, speaking of substance abuse and addiction to inhibitors, let's talk about the Night Runners. So I talked about the Night Runners in a more detailed separate video, but I'll discuss them here too, because, well, they're awesome and why the hell not. Some of the info will be regurgitated from that video. If you want to check it out, it's up there, where we discussed a tape from a Night Runner called Anton Novak. But anyway, here are the basics. The Night Runners were started up by a man we meet midway through the game named Frank Marway. Frank himself was a former Special Forces Commando. Their name, Night Runners, suggests exactly that. This group would brave the dangers of the night and help people who were in trouble. This involved clearing out dark zones, areas which were infested with infected, and people who needed to get out. The Night Runners would swoop in and rescue them, and this also included fighting bandits who were preying on innocents. Essentially, Frank wanted the city to become a safe place for everyone. At some point, Frank decided it was time to get more hands-on with helping people in the city, so he started to recruit people to help him. He assembled a decent team and called them the Night Runners, and he had recruited locals such as former soldier Hakon and Killian. But due to the demanding nature of what the Night Runners did, they relied heavily upon inhibitors. We discussed earlier in the video that inhibitors are a mix of antigen and a THV derivative. As you see in the game, Aiden starts to suffer serious side effects after about 10 doses. Inhibitors kill 95% of people who take them, and that's why Night Runners, although effective at what they do, were quite low in number. We find out early that people refer to them in a past tense, and some of the citizens of Villador flat out deny that they even existed. So what happened to them? The Night Runners were active in pretty much the whole city, but at some point the army saw them as junkies due to their abuse of inhibitors and kicked them out of Old Villador. They settled in the central loop, but given that Frank's father was an architect, Frank himself had a fairly decent idea of how to design and build, so he built the Fisheye Canteen as a place where people could feel safe. Frank decided that the Night Runners needed additional methods in order to keep the people in the city safe. 
He discovered the existence of a radio transmitter, which the military shot down years earlier. According to the Council of Mankind sessions, the power and the transmitter had been shut off so survivors wouldn't find out the extent of the outbreak prior to the Black Monday bombings. Frank wanted to activate this transmitter and use it to broadcast warnings and messages to survivors in the city to ensure better chances of survival. The only problem? It's on top of the looming VNC tower in the central loop, the tallest building in the city. No one had ever attempted to climb up the tower due to the simple fact that it's a volatile nest. It's swarming with infected. Frank's team embarked on their mission but got absolutely decimated. They fail in their mission and the transmitter remained dormant for years. That is until Aiden switches it back on. With most of his night runners gone, Frank disbanded the night runners and everyone went their separate ways. Killian settled into Old Villador, as did Hakon. Frank is haunted by the deaths of his night runners and spirals into a deep depression and turns to drink as a way to cope. Those of you who have played the story will know how it ends for Frank and the Night Runners. You can either side with him and give him the transmitter or give it to someone else, but that is entirely up to you. It's also possible that Luan would become leader of the Night Runners depending on your path taken throughout the game. Aiden first meets Luan under, well, awkward circumstances. Prior to the events of the game when all the Night Runners were building the Fisheye Canteen, Luan was there too and became great friends with Frank. Frank, in one of his journals, describes Luan as having a dark side. She eventually develops a romantic relationship with Hakon, and the two at some point share an apartment together in the central loop. Hakon and Luan's relationship ended, well, it was messy, with Hakon ending up on a hit list that Luan had drawn up. The narrative tells us that Hakon broke Luan's heart, but that's really not the case. There's a lot more to it than a jilted lover's revenge. You see, the night before the failed VNC tower mission, Hakon got in Frank's face and told him that it was a suicide mission. Killian also thought so too, and as a result, both Hakon and Killian failed to show up for the mission. Hakon also ditched Luan at this point and left the central loop. Now this hit Luan hard, due to Luan's affection for Frank and her affection and love for the Night Runners. In her eyes, this was the ultimate betrayal. She blamed Hakon for Frank falling apart and I guess for his part in destroying the hope of the people. Remember that hit list? Well, also on the hit list are Colonel Williams and Waltz. Luan explains that she wants to kill Williams because she feels he took everything away from her with the bombings. But why Waltz? Well, it turns out that Luan was also a child test subject by Waltz, but it's likely that the same experiments with her didn't go as far as they did with Aiden, as she doesn't seem to possess the same abilities that he does. Eventually, depending on your playthrough, Luan dies, or she lives and becomes leader of the Night Runners, and or leaves the city with Aiden. So in the final days before Dying Light 2 was released, Techland hosted a community event which explained how Spike got out of Haran. People were very confused to see Spike appear in the start of Dying Light 2 because, in their minds, either the infection got out, or Haran was nuked by Kyle Crane, I guess. I guess this spike event was purely to keep the possibility of both endings being canon plausible. Now all people had to do was watch a trailer which showed Spike escorting survivors out of Haran and through the countryside shortly before Kyle arrived in the countryside and met the Children of the Sun. This is how Spike got out of Haran. We know through conversation with Spike at the start of the game that at some point he met a woman called Jane on his travels who became his girlfriend. So in the story you meet a guy named Juan Rayner. Juan is a distributor who isn't affiliated with the Peacekeepers, but has set up shop on the Peacekeeper ship Missy. He is in fact affiliated with the Renegades. At one point regarding who to give the transmitter to, as a third kind of curveball in the plot, if choosing the Peacekeepers, Aiden also has the option to install a wiretap on the transmitter for Juan, so he can listen in and warn Colonel Williams and the Renegades of the Peacekeeper's intentions. But this then leads to Frank dying, and residents dying too. This would then lead to Juan and the Renegades ruling the city, which isn't an ideal outcome. At one point in the game, Juan is tasked with getting hold of UV lamps for the Peacekeepers. Juan does however point out that Jack Matt has been skimming UV lamps from the Orders in order to facilitate their efforts in taking over the tower. I guess the next thing to discuss would be what Major Jack Matt's motives are. It's clear through the game that Jack Matt isn't well at all. He's dying. Now this is likely due to the fact that he has cancer from exposure to the chemicals from Black Monday. 
We've already explained that Matt appeared to ignore the warnings and the evacuation notice from Colonel Williams prior to the bombings. His motive for this was that he knew the people of Villador would end up rising up against Williams, driving him out of the city and he would therefore be able to have a free run at controlling the city. The fact that Matt was willing to sacrifice the lives of so many for that little bit more power shows us just how power hungry the man actually was and this is echoed by Captain Posner in his reports. Juan tells us at one point that Matt wants the transmitter in order to warn people of an imminent attack on the city by the Butcher. Juan tells us that this is incorrect as the Butcher isn't even planning an attack. Juan mentions that the Colonel knows that going to war would be the end of the city. You see, the Colonel had a lever which, if pulled, would release toxic chemical water into Villador, potentially killing everyone. The only defence Williams had was that the dam was surrounded by water, which is why Matt wanted Aiden to drain the area around the dam, giving his men access. Jack Matt, in his pursuit of power, even tried to assassinate Frank after making his peacekeepers disguise themselves as renegades in an attempt to start a war involving peacekeepers, survivors and renegades, with the idea that the survivors would be wanting vengeance for Frank. Another decision comes in here, in that Aiden can choose to save Frank or go after a vehicle instead. Seems that if you side with Jack Matt and refuse to help Juan plant a wiretap on the VNC transmitter, Matt realises that Juan is a renegade and therefore knows about his role in the bombings of Black Monday, and desperate to keep his secret, he hangs Juan as a traitor. But it seems that Jack Matt's peacekeepers are already suspicious. If this is truth, then I demand a real time. Matt was responsible for the missile strike years ago? I, I'd heard some rumours, but... It doesn't make any sense. Matt wants to attack the dam! As for who rules Villador, well that all comes down to who you choose to give overall power to. Nothing major changes in terms of storyline with these choices, just the way the city is after the story ends. I mean, for example, if you give the water tower to the peacekeepers instead of the survivors back in old Villador, the bazaar basically gets overrun, and if you go back there later, it's in pretty bad shape. If you trust Juan and upload the wiretap to the transmitter, the renegades and Juan end up ruling the city, imposing strict laws and curfews which the survivors end up protesting against and citizens end up dying. It's like the March Massacre all over again. The ending which is considered the good ending is everyone surviving and the city being held and governed by the free folk and the night runners being re-established, which is a fairly controversial outcome for some considering how hostile they were towards Aiden at the start of the game. But that is it for this video. I hope that did a bit to explain what happened in Dying Light 2 and the origins and lead up to the events of the main storyline. As mentioned in this video, I have individual videos on more specific Dying Light 2 topics, so be sure to check those out too. As for where Techland take this next, well, I'm not sure. Maybe following Aiden and Luan's travels through the Outlands? Maybe they find a new settlement showing that Villador is not in fact the last remaining city on Earth. Who knows, let me know your theories below. If you like this video, please leave a like and subscribe if you aren't already. But for now, take care and I will see you in the next one.